When I do theology, I like to think about, well, what difference does that make really to real people? Because if you just get too abstract, it makes no difference to anybody whatsoever. My children say that I'm not very funny. <laughs> I think I'm funny. I'm Lucy Pepiat and I'm the principal of Westminster Theological Centre in the UK. I've always been interested in Paul, um, well, in my adult life and since I first read the Bible, which was in my 20s. I just really was quite taken with Paul as a person. So I love reading his letters and I like the way he comes across. I find him quite a fascinating person and um, I'm fascinated by his theology. And then I... It was quite recent, really, about three and a half years ago. I was studying 1 Corinthians 11, which is a highly problematic passage to do with women and head coverings or possibly hairstyles. And really, for the first time, I thought, this doesn't... Well, I knew it didn't make sense, but the, for the first time, I thought, I wonder, you know, what do people really say about this? It doesn't make any sense. And I started researching in earnest what other people say about it and how they read it and, and commentators. And, um, and as I did that, I just got more and more drawn in to the passage as a, as a really problematic and very complex. And then I started to think there might be another way of reading this that would simplify it for us. The most common way, I think, is to read it as if Paul is saying that the natural order of things is that women take uh, should have some kind of subordinate role to men or need some kind of covering from a man, um, which the head covering symbolises or possibly the hairstyle symbolises, nobody's quite sure. And then that is transferred into church life and practice so to as it to say that a woman can't take a position of leadership unless a man is covering her so it sort of it starts in a physical sense with this physical head covering which has a metaphysical significance to your own head and then the head that covers you it's very very complicated and then that is transferred out into a church setting where it's assumed that women need some kind of covering that is male in order to do something, because the issue is a woman shouldn't pray or prophesy without this covering. So in order to, to contribute to the worship, a woman should be covered. I think that's probably the best way of explaining it. What sparked my imagination is I ha was more interested in Paul's theology of the church in other places where I think that his vision for the church is a place where people of difference and people who in the world would have been put into categories of some being inferior and superior, whether that's based on wealth, gender, um, it, you know, economic status, where you were born. So you've got in Galatians 3.28, he uses these three pairings of Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female. And uh, But in Ephesians 2, he talks about the Jew and Gentile difference, which is a barrier of hostility, having been completely broken down in Christ, so that they become one new man in Christ. So if Christ is the new temple, and if Paul really has this vision of a new humanity, so when we come together to worship, if we're one new person in Christ, so there is no inferiority and superiority, there's no, you know, I'm better than you um, for any reason, then 
I became interested. I mean, I think that's an amazing picture anyway in terms of racial differences, in terms of economic differences, you know, in terms of our status, how where we were born just by chance. Um, and then what what are the implications of that for men and women? Like, if, if we're really brothers and sisters in Christ, if we're really co-heirs, if we're really um, participating in the kingdom as sons, which is what he talks about in Romans, you know, but we're all co-heirs, basically, then what is this business of needing some kind of um, covering or something to uh, validate my ability to minister. Um, I, that doesn't make sense to me. So I was, I was fascinated by Paul's vision for church. And then this, 11, this 1 Corinthians 11 is like a sort of, it, you know, it just affronts you. It seems wrong. And um, so does the end of 1 Corinthians 14, actually. It just comes out at you. Like, this is weird. And um, the rest of Paul's letters, he clearly works with women. They're his co-workers. They're church leaders. They're evangelists. They disciple people. Priscilla discipled Apollos, you know. So it doesn't fit. And Paul, in the rest of Paul, um, he, I think he just seems fantastic. He seems a really free person. Like, he's setting up this church where um, he's breaking down barriers. So why is he then just putting another barrier in, in 11? That was my question. My, to my um, thesis is that Paul in the passage in 11 and in 14, 20 to 25, and at the end of 14, is using the words of the Corinthians that he probably has in front of him in their letter that they have written to him. So our one Corinthians is actually two Corinthians because there's been a letter from him and a response. We know that he's correcting them in their practices and in their theology on a number of different issues, right? So he has problems with them because of their immorality and their views on marriage and their views on the resurrection and um, they're taking each other to court. And it, it's all sorts of issues that he's bringing up and, and they're a divided church. So he's got all these things that he's addressing and um, we're assuming that in their response to him that they've kind of defended they've said well this is why we're doing what we're doing so he's having this to and fro with them now I th we, we know in 1 Corinthians that he does cite them so all scholars will say he cites the Corinthians at some point and if you look if we look in our Bibles um, we'll find quotation marks at various places in 1 Corinthians because it's so established now that editors just say, yeah, let's just put that down as the Corinthians. Um, but so far, it, it will just be a phrase, a sentence. So my proposal is controversial because I'm proposing that there's more than just a sentence, that he's actually taking quite a developed idea from the Corinthians on why women should wear head coverings and he's reproducing it in order to uh, show them that they're wrong and so then he gives a counter argument so he reproduces bits of their argument in 3 to 10 and then he produces a counter argument in 11 to 16 and then in 14 20 to 25 does the same thing and at the end of 14 and the, there are various markers for instance like a rhetorical question that will come at a certain place where he'll just say so in 11 it's um he says judge for yourselves is it fitting for a woman to pray without head covering and i think by that stage he's hoping that they'll go of course it is because <laughs> um, i think he thinks it is We know the background was that they had these factions. So we know that uh, there were, you know, he says, oh, I follow Apollos and I follow Christ and I follow Cephas. Um, and he, this offends him. You know, this is, as far as he's concerned, this is utterly wrong that the church should be split and divided into factions. Um, and 
I think that this that what has given rise to this idea that women should wear head coverings and that the married women should be quiet and ask their husbands at home and you know that there's there's obviously some kind of uh, dampening down of the women in some way. Now, a lot of people think that that's because they were out of order, so they they were being difficult. So Paul had to come in and say, you know, just behave yourselves, girls, and settle down kind of thing. Um, But so my idea is that Paul, that, that what has happened in Paul's absence is that a group of domineering men have taken over the church, which is not so hard to imagine, and uh, that they have then implemented what they think are the right practices for the order of men and women, but actually have ended up in Paul's eyes to be oppressive practices and to be ones which are um, you know, forcing women to, uh, in order to be part of the worship, to conform to some kind of um, extra, you know, practice that like put on your head covering before you pray. Um, and they had constructed a, a theology for that, um, which we find in 3 to 10, um, because uh, the, wom- the man is the image and glory of God and woman is his glory. So woman has no glory of her own con- conferred upon her by God. It's it's mediated through the male and therefore she has to have some kind of symbol um, in order to take part in the gathered um, worship service. I think he does have a theology of head. So I, I would, I'd prefer to move away from headship, as it, which is something we've constructed to try and understand what Paul means by kephale. That I, I'm, I, we know that Paul has some understanding. He uses kephale, he uses this idea of head to describe the relationship of the church to Christ. So we know that from Ephesians 5. And... Kephale comes up again, obviously, in 11. And so we know he has some kind of theology of Kephale, and we're not entirely sure what that is. We don't know exactly what it means. So I, I, I try and unpick a bit of that, of how problematic that is for us to get to. So the idea of the head is Paul's, very definitely. But... Um, I, I'm really unconvinced that he sees it as some kind of hier- hierarchical sequential order, you, you know, where you start at the top and end at the bottom with God and woman. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't think. It, I'm pretty sure it doesn't mean that. Um, so, so the fact that we've taken headship to mean that is what's wrong. The fact that he uses head is is a puzzle for us at the moment, and one which I think needs a lot more work, actually. It's a really good question to, for us to try and work out what was the situation for women that Paul walked into. And um, it seems it's hard for us to get really to the bottom of it, but it seems that uh, there were places, so there were cults where women were active and would have taught and would have led and would have been prominent. Um, There were also, if you were a wealthy Roman woman, you would have actually had quite a lot of status and um, power in your own uh, milieu, I suppose. But the general situation for women, I think, was pretty appalling. So it's not that there weren't instances where women could have occupied positions of leadership, could have been educated, could have had some kind of um, empowered status. But it was, I would say, from what I've read, I would say that that seems to be more exceptional rather than the norm. So I think we should assume that Paul came into, or Paul lived in a culture that was relentlessly patriarchal and that if you had been born a woman you would have been born assuming that you were a second class citizen so if you listen to the experiences of people who were born into that kind of culture 
it they rarely do have ideas above their station they really do, you know they are deeply affected by having been born into a place where they are told that they are second class citizens and um you get and then in those situations you often get kind of prophetic voices minorities single people suddenly saying no i'm going to break out of this and and wanting to lead other people in that but um but to be to be born into a subordinate position is a highly disempowering thing i would i would posit So I think that Paul did empower women. I think that was the kind of general trend of his ministry. Um, and I think, but I also think that if if women were difficult, he wouldn't have a problem in making sure they also conform to the fact that we should be in mutual submission to one another. And that we don't, you know, we don't become bossy and domineering people. And I think that there's something like that going on in 1 Timothy 2. It's kind of a, it's a sort of, you see, you see something different going on. I don't, I, yeah. So I think Paul's, the general principle for Paul is that leadership should be, a, take a cruciform shape. That if we are called to be leaders, if we're called to be apostles, um, that we do that, men and women, in a fully Christ-like manner, which is actually to be in submission, to take a submissive role, really, and a submissive role with with the people we're leading, even in a funny way. So you have, you know, there's a, the, Paul has a very uh, complicated uh, presentation of power because he has no problem telling people what to do and taking some kind of very authoritative leadership role. But on the other hand, he also has this very, very strong theology of submission. And he describes himself as the bottom of the pile and, you know, the lowest of the low and the dishonored. And so, um, so it, and, and, and he seems to offer that as the, as the paradigm for Christian leadership to be the one who who serves which is what we should expect really if it, you know from a christian from a leadership that's modeled on the person of christ the, it's very difficult for me to um fully defend my thesis in that there's no punctuation there's n there's no indication that Paul is saying oh now you guys say and I'm saying this or that so and I acknowledge that in the book that it's not it's not provable in any way um, so that's one point the the other point is of course people will say oh but you know is it just because you don't like the conclusions and therefore you're constructing some kind of system whereby that allows you to then eliminate that as the voice of Paul um, which and already I've sort of seen various responses hinting at that I think what I would say um, I, I can't defend it on the grounds of saying oh it's absolutely clear I can't say that um, but I what I would go back to with the question of um, are you just going to sort of excise the bits you don't like? I would say, no, absolutely not. The point about, especially the 11 and the 14, 20 to 25, is that they're so deeply problematic. If someone had come up with a good solution already after 2,000 years, then uh, there wouldn't be a need to keep picking at it. But uh, nobody has. No one's come up with a good enough solution yet. Um, they're, they're all flawed and uh, they just are confusing. Uh, they, the worst ways of reading it are very, very oppressive to women. And then you have some very, very complicated ways of reading it, which are actually quite difficult to remember. That You know, you can read it and say, oh, maybe does that make sense? But you couldn't actually reproduce it. You couldn't say, oh, yes, well, I think, you know, because kefale means this and then the glory of means this and man and woman means this. So um, the current explanations are highly convoluted.
what would he have done? You know, because he would come into these contexts and just evangelize, and people would become Christians, and then he had to teach them in the faith. So, you know, what would he teach them? And, and we obviously we've got quite a lot of material in his epistles, um, but we don't have everything. Um, but I I think that this concept of unity is absolutely essential for him. Um, Jesus Christ as the new temple, as the person that dwells in us and us in him, that then transforms, actually transforms everything about us. That's how we become ethical beings. You know, that's how we become the people who can then love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. So he, he, deals, he deals in like massive theological concepts, I would say, and that they they root his view of the church and how we should behave towards one another. So it's to do with who we become in Christ, the big ontological questions, but always with this ethical um, imperative behind it. So he was actually quite directive and instructive about, well, this is what it means. This is now you're going to have to behave like this. So... Um, I would say he has these two strands of uh, being concerned with how people behave and how they are seen to behave in a Christ-like manner towards one another. Um, but he would, but he, and this, I think this is why, as a theologian, I love Paul because he. It's not just that he tells you what to do; he gives you deep theological rationale for why you should do it. You know, and it's not it's not just, oh, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. He constructs this view of this new humanity. And then it's because you know who you are in Christ. It's because you have your identity as the son, daughter. It's because you've been filled with the spirit. It's because the spirit's shed abroad the love of God into your heart. It's because you are a new man and woman that you then are able to live without fear of one another. Um, you're you're in able to submit yourself to someone. It's a horrible thing to submit yourself to somebody else, quite frankly. You know, who wants to do it? And and it involves a huge amount of trust and self-denial and acknowledgement that they, you know, they might be right. And I think that was his picture of the church. I think I, I think he saw that if you could, if we could eliminate fear of one another, hatred of one another, uh, the kind of gender wars, tribal wars, you know, um, and and even he saw that ha he wanted that to happen in these little congregations when we come together to break bread, to worship, to pray, to prophesy, to use the gifts of the spirit. So I think he was, um, it, you know, Paul was a charismatic. Paul talks about the gifts of the Spirit, especially in 1 Corinthians. And that, and that was all his picture. So you have the micro stuff going on, but, it, but it's informed and shaped by these huge, massive concepts of what it means to be in Christ and to be this new creation in the church. There's this very, very strange passage in the middle of uh, 14 where one is expecting, Paul's explained tongues and prophecy um, of how he views tongues and prophecy. So they, they're clearly using tongues and prophecy. I mean, they're a crazy charismatic church. And it, what, what I find so fascinating about Paul is that instead of coming in and saying just stop it you know this is totally out of order um he he doesn't say that he says eagerly desire spiritual gifts well they've got spiritual gifts but you know and especially that you may prophesy well that's going to cause a whole load of problems but then he teaches so he does a bit of teaching on tongues and prophecy um, I think that they were, their idea had been, well, let's all just pray in tongues all at once and then we'll just be so glorious and spiritual. When people come in, you know, they'll be overwhelmed by the presence of God and then they'll, you know, give their lives to Jesus. And he's thinking, no, it'll be a disaster because they'll come in, they'll think you're all mad and silly and childish and no, prophecy is for unbelievers because you're speaking intelligible words 
and tongues is for you guys. It's a, it's an in-house practice unless it's interpreted. That that's what he teaches, and so in the middle of that verse, twenty-two comes as a, a as a sort of um, it's just wrong because he suddenly says that tongues is for um, unbelievers and. You know, so I think the Corinth, I think that is the Corinthian phrase, um, but yeah. So he's committed to spiritual gifts, but of course, the the high point of one Corinthians is one Corinthians thirteen, and this is to do with spiritual gifts. So his whole um, framing of spiritual gifts is that they have to be done in this Christ-like, loving manner. If you're going to use spiritual gifts. You've got to use that. You've you've got to learn how to love people like Christ loved people first. Then you can use your spiritual gifts because then they won't be abusive. Because anyone, I mean anyone from a charismatic or Pentecostal background will know how abusive spiritual gifts can become. And um, I think they had become like that. But what I love about this letter is that instead of coming in and saying, "Okay, that's enough, no more," he he says, "No, no, no." This is what you do with spiritual gifts. You operate in a, the most loving manner possible, and then they will be powerful, and then you know they will have the effect that they're meant to have. I had a great response from Scott McKnight very soon. Well, actually, he'd seen the manuscript, so when it was published, he was ready to post about it. Um, he's very enthusiastic about what I've done. Um, so that's been gratifying. I'm hugely grateful to him because he actually has reproduced my argument in a, in a very, very clear way and done a brilliant job of that. So um, Scott has done a, a proper response to it. I, I look and see, you know, what's out there. Um, and there are a few reviews, a few people have blogged about it. It's obviously provocative and it's obviously an innovation. So I think people are going to take some time to think about it. Um, the, the most interesting responses and immediate responses I get is when I teach it because I'm a teacher and I teach it to my students and I also teach in local churches I go and I get asked to speak and so I have taught on this often and the responses I get from regular men and women in the church is actually I get quite a powerful response as I teach them this and say that I think that these are liberating texts to women and men actually um, and I get very strong uh, positive responses to that. But I, I mean, I know there'll be negative responses coming, uh, but what I'm interested in really is, uh, people who don't want to change their minds won't change their minds, that doesn't matter. Uh, what I'm interested in to see is, um, I've issued a challenge to some of the traditional readings because I think they're too problematic. And actually what I would like to see is people who want to keep defending them finding a way of doing that because I think that what we're left with really is either having to say Paul is very very confused which is an option and um, I know many people who would end up there um, or if you want to adhere to the to the theology in the passage and the um, ruling in the passage then women should be in head coverings really. I, I wrote the book, The Disciple, partly because it came out of my PhD thesis, which I wrote on Christ and the Spirit, and I wanted to uh, look at models of Christ and the Spirit and how they, t what they teach us about who we are as human beings. So what does it mean that Christ is the prototypical human being and the man also the man filled with the spirit and that so that so I looked at all that kind of trinitarian theology um so I'd I'd done my PhD part-time and I was also a pastor and I'm also a mum of four boys and so we have a lot of conversation about in our home and we do a lot of hospitality and um my husband and I've worked with a lot of young people and one of the things that 
matters to us is that we are able to give them foundations that will build a faith for them for their whole lives. Because we've seen so many people, obviously when you pastor for years, you see many, many people as Christians hitting a wall, hitting something, and they just can't get past it and they and they give up because it's it's too hard. And I think that if we can give if we can help each other with the right foundations and the right kind of communities and the right ways of relating that we can we can come through those walls and those crises and those traumas that we all face everybody is going to face them and um so i'd been with my husband been interested in this whole question then I did my theology and I thought I wonder if I could write a book that would weave in some of the theology that I have been immersed in but that I think is uh, so helpful to serve as this foundation you know these foundations for the faith where we understand who we are in Christ we understand something about God we understand something about ourselves that kind of keeps us in for the long haul so in the disciple i tried to articulate that in a not not a very long book so it has some theology and some uh, looking at the bible and then a little bit of sort of some testimony and some application of well what does that actually mean and how does that help me to follow jesus and to understand how i might possibly become like him in some way. So that's what I was addressing. The, the book that really shaped me in terms of the discipleship was Dallas Willard, The Divine Conspiracy. So that was, I think it's absolutely brilliant and I think it should just be read by everybody if you can it's a little bit dense and I think I was trying to make him a bit more accessible as well so for the discipleship stuff that would be he, he was definitely he's a, a hero of mine theologically I can't really point to one uh, person who has made all the difference although I do it, with the Christology work that I've done I love um Cyril on the unity of Christ and I love reading Athanasius on the incarnation of the word so I find I find that they're quite short texts but they're extremely rich and generative in terms of us understanding who Christ is and then that helps me to work out you know how I would like to understand who, what human beings are um, and in terms of m mentors I um, the the funny thing is this that all my mentors have been men, really, and um, they've. I, I've had the privilege and been fortunate enough to have some wonderful uh, men around me who've said, uh, "Go for it, go for it," with academics and writing, and especially my PhD supervisor, Murray Ray. He's been brilliant. So I've, d yeah, I've been very fortunate in having people behind me and supporting me and helping me.